Good luck understanding any of the time travel in this. <laughs> Captain's Pod, start date 13, 32, 24.1. Welcome to Starship. Hello, Mrs. Twain. Um, thank you for joining us as we take a brief shore leave from the world of Cinema Sins to explore the universe of Star Trek. I'm your Captain Ian Whittington, and with me as always, she's back from enjoying Nog's Hollow Sweet program. It's Ambassador Danae. I'm sorry, I feel gross. Yeah, you should feel gross because when gross. I gave you a handshake earlier and it was wet, I said it's because I washed my hands and it's not. Oh my god, I don't need. How did. How... Wait, how did. The fluid leave the hollow suite with you. You bring it in with you. Never mind. Yep. What? No, <laughs> none of that metaphor works on any <laughs> level. Ambassador, how are you doing? Certainly there's juices on the holodeck. Yeah, but they shouldn't leave the holodeck is what I'm saying. They should be on the holodeck and then evaporate into nothingness because they're, they're fake. Unless they're tying the replicator into the holodeck and making physical... Which is the only way you explain snow That's and shit the suite. leaving. That's yeah. the hollow suite. It's an updated version. It, it has, has a replicator. You know how it. there's like those little things you can go to and it's, what do they call it? 4, 4D versions where they like spray yeah, with uh -huh. spritz and stuff. It's the, yeah, it's I can't that. imagine anything making my cinema experience worse. It's bad enough that there are other people present. But to have that plus like water on me and mm -hmm. sudden like mm -hmm. heat or a vibrating mm -hmm. chair. I don't, mm -hmm. just show mm -hmm. me the fucking movie. But you're in a Rumble. holodeck, so it's different. See, this That's you're thinking different. you're thinking to yes. like twenty first century. This is the future. Yeah. I can't believe we're having the, this conversation this way around. You want <laughs> lubrication. Stop. No, enough. <laughs> Stop. Oh, I don't oh. You did it. Let's do some emails. You, e you <laughs> do some did email. this. Okay, hailing frequencies open, everyone. It's time for us to read your emails from Twitter, Discord, and, well, email. Um, we actually have another audio message this week. It's the return of gentleman cartoonist Ken Holzhauser. Greetings again to the Cinterprise. This is gentleman cartoonist Ken Holzhauser. I'm contacting you again today to say I was very excited to hear myself on Captain's Pod. Oh, the voice. For those of you that don't know, a few weeks ago, um, Ken messaged in, and all I can remember is that he has a beautiful voice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you want this to be reduced to a voice? Are you kidding? Hey, if I had that voice, I would happily be reduced to it. It's amazing. Uh, although you needn't be dismayed as to whether or not I was concerned about your reactions to Darmok. It's... An entirely different situation. My feelings for these episodes is, well, it's mine. I had them when I was younger, when I watched the show. I have them when I watch it again. But like a lot of Star Trek fans, we tend to take uh, received wisdom, fan lore, gossip, research, and all of these things smash into our heads to form a sort of consensus that can be preserved in amber. What I enjoy about Captain's Pod is that you are taking a very fresh approach to these episodes. The classics in particular, you're looking at them straight on as this is a 45 to 50 minute piece of entertainment. What does it say to me? What? How does it hold up? Is it any good? And I personally enjoy that. I love hearing another perhaps dissenting viewpoint about an episode because it's a way for me to do the thing that I cannot do anymore, which is watch it for the first time. Yeah. Preach, sir. Yeah. It's what such a wonderful a great thing because it is, it is scary to have that dissenting view. Mm -hmm. Especially with something as widespread as Star Trek. Right. Where so much has already been said. Yeah. Like he said, like it's kind of preserved in amber. You, at some point with the, what you watch or what you read, it is preserved in a, a place in your history. And when you watch it again, it accesses this part of you that reignites memories and feelings like a little time capsule. And it's precious. And that will filter and, you know, shift maybe you watching it with that new kind of like set of eyes. So I appreciate that Ken and maybe others kind of experiencing that with 
me coming on and like having a different view i don't know no it's great it it really is valuable it's and ken's scary. describing <laughs> this is, ken's describing the same thing that i've experienced where having a fresh pair of eyes with me as i'm rewatching some stuff is so important because i just throw star trek on as a matter of course and i'm not being analytical it's just my happy place it's just like eating my favorite candy i just i throw it on so diving in with you and a 2024 pair of spectacles is so interesting and some of like the points that we've kind of noodled have been i've like opened my eyes to something that i've been with for over 30 years and i feel like the beauty of star trek is that we could in 15 years from now start this all over again and have a different viewpoint again we would just need a different Danae. <laughs> yeah, Danae could not do this all over again. <laughs> I, I would, I it would be the same thing for me. I would have a pre-existing yeah. experience. So yeah, but I think every ten years or so, like things shift, shift and change. Some things are evergreen. Um, and my favorite episode may not be the same as it was um, right now. It's very happy to hear from you. And I know I note that uh, Danae did not mention what she felt about the sketches, or she was initially <laughs> thinking that I had sketched the two of you. So I've thrown together a little cartoon, and I've sent it along your way, and hopefully uh, you'll think it's cute. As always, I do. live long in Podsper. Oh my gosh, that's so, so nice. Thanks, Thank you, Ken. Ken. And I, the doodle <laughs> that Ken made for us is adorable. It's it really so is adorable. Great. It's really, really great. So, it's so fun. Quick behind the scenes on that. I showed it to my daughter and she's like, oh, somebody drew a picture of you. Are you a legend? <laughs> <laughs> she's asked me this a couple of times now where she'll see me with like a picture of me in the past on stage or something. Mm. And she doesn't say, are you famous? She says, are you a legend? And yes, she's asked that so twice in recent history. One when she saw a picture of you on stage and one when, when you drew this picture because she had no idea. It's so fun. And I said, no, I'm not a legend, but. You should say yes, absolutely. And so are you, young lady. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Let's not, no. Let's not do well, that. It's an amazing bit of fan art. We absolutely love it. We'll put it in the description for this episode. Ian, please remember to do that. Here's a little here's a little thing. I wanted to make sure that I remembered what the word descent actually means mm. like when I heard the audio. And so for those of you who think you know, let's just go to the dictionary and be sure that we're all on the same page. I love this word. Descent. Holding or expressing opinions that are at variance with those commonly or officially held. Yes. Descent, my people. <laughs> Disagreeing descent. with or refusing to confirm to the doctrine of an established or orthodox church was an example. <laughs> yeah, fuck it. <laughs> Rise there, up. But I love that there's a way to do it with respect and an understanding yeah. of like the fuller context. So I'm glad that you uh, appreciate the approach, Ken. Thank you for listening and for being a part of our community. Heck yeah. I think the most important point that Ken made was that, and this would be so valuable to remember when you go into like discussions about fandom and stuff, is that, another person's opinion should not affect your enjoyment of the thing you can love it for whatever reason you want and it don't don't let anybody detract from that shields up people shields yeah. up get them shields up and love what we you love. all should have an internal deflector dish okay no because the deflector dish is oh, different. pushing things out of way as you travel yeah but shields protect you we should we should have both then. Absolutely, yeah. you should as you go through life push people away. <laughs> push, push people highly, away. That's the message. I highly yeah. recommend it. <laughs> push people out of your life. Amazing. <laughs> okay, ambassador. This week we continue our time travel theme and we take a trip to Voyager with a seven of nine episode. This is called Relativity. Any predictions before we get into it? Mm. I predict seven of nine is going to be in it. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, good, good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Relativity. I mean, there's like the, th it makes me think of the, th well, of course, the theory of relativity. Mm -hmm, yeah. Which, of course, you know that one by heart, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the one where basically if you're moving really, really super duper fast, you experience time differently. I think it's one of those. <laughs> It's really complicated. I know that much. <laughs> but yeah, time, time and space are like, time is a physical thing and mass and gravity can affect how quickly time travels. And if you travel really fast, then you'll start experiencing time differently. Mm. See, I, yeah, I, I totally knew that. 
Good I'm job. I'm totally I'm, wrong. I put no. you on the spot. Yeah. Should we look it up? Let's do it. What's the actual definition of relativity? Okay, the, act, the, the actual definition is the absence of standards of absolute and universal application. No, that's not right. That's moral re- relativity. Oh, in physics, here we go. The dependence of various physical phenomena on relative motion of the observer and the observed objects, especially regarding the nature, behavior of light, space, time, and gravity. That's what I said. That depending on like space, time, gravity, how fast you're traveling, you perceive time differently compared to something that is stationary so if you're going like really close to the speed of light um from the the observer that's stationary if they could watch you you wouldn't age they would experience a hundred years and you would look exactly the same but as you're looking back at them they would start aging very very rapidly in a nutshell one time i saw the space station (laughs) (laughs) it's amazing because who pointed it out to you (laughs) You did. I was like, the fuck is up with that Why star? Why is that moving so fast? <laughs> it's like really booking it. You're like, yeah, that going. is the International Space Station. And you can tell because it's not going to go with the horizon. Check it out. And it just like went yeah. off in the distance. So we were observing them not aging and they were observing us aging. Is that what you're saying? No, because oh, they're okay. not traveling anywhere near. F- they're booking it, but they're not going that fast. They I are mean, too. Technically, yes. They are, people in space are aging at a different rate to us. Exactly. That's but exactly what it is. Imperceptibly. Yeah. Imperceptibly. Oh, man. You know. Welcome to Ian Bullshit's Science Corner, people. Buckle in. <laughs> this is a new segment we're doing. The yeah, Bullshit Ian, Science Corner. Ian, Ian Bullshit <laughs> some science. Don't email me, people. So obviously this episode is going to be about aging rapidly, you know? Oh, or a parent or guardian or like a, a, a grandparent shows up, like a relative. Oh, is this a Thanksgiving episode? Wait, what's say so much happened then. How did we get from relatives to, oh, Thanksgiving, right. Um, okay. <laughs> could be Thanksgiving episode. Could be, could be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe somebody eats like a turkey leg in this episode. A turkey leg is consumed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's amazing is, again, you have described on this occasion two different episodes of Star Trek. So, without further ado, let's head over to the holodeck and watch the episode! Welcome to Ted Ford, part of the show where we grab something from the replicator, assuming it doesn't go bad after an hour, and share our immediate (laughs) thoughts and feelings on the episode we just watched. Most important question, first Ambassador, what would you like from the replicator? Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about this, but mm. three-day-old coffee will do. Ew. Yeah, I want that pot roast. I want Neelix's pot roast. Let's no, you go. don't. You don't yeah. know how. No, it's no, like the you replicator. Would... Yeah, but we Safe. don't know. If... Mm. It was saying that it was like people were getting sick. Not from the pot roast. You don't know that. They didn't specify. It was uneaten. It was you a would... completely un uneaten pot roast. It was beautiful. So, if you had to pick between three-day-old coffee. And potentially immediately bad roast. Rancid roast, yeah. What would you choose? <sighs> okay, here's the thing. How here's do you the have thing. To think about because, this. Here's the thing. Because I I I think I've told this story before. On one of my commutes to work, I got into my car and I got on my, my thermos of coffee and I took a huge swig out of it and realized it tasted odd. I then realized that I couldn't remember the last time that I'd filled it up with coffee and I tracked it back to about four or five days previous. So I was drinking, and this was the middle of summer. So I took a big swing, right? That, that's the face you should be making. So now when I think about coffee that's gone bad, I can taste Ugh. it. I can't taste a bad pot roast. <laughs> okay, so I might be changing my mind now, but it, <laughs> yep. I was thinking it was just like black coffee. If it's just black coffee, then you just take the three day old coffee because it's yeah, just fair. a thick... Yep. It's could have, it. but if it has milk, milk in it, in it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then it's chunky. Yeah, sure is. Tastes oddly metallic as well. Ambassador, give us a synopsis. Oh ah. my gosh! Okay, so in today's episode, yeah, good luck. We have the joy of going back in time and seeing seeing how Voyager was bed before it was the Voyager that we know. Yeah, it's dry. It's docked. It's under attack from the future. Oh, yes. Who who is responsible? Something with a point 
zero zero six thingy. Oh come on, point zero zero three, three chroniton Chron- variant. Chroniton fluxing going Ambassador. on. Ambassador. Who who is the mysterious person attacking past future Voyager? Who else? But somebody that doesn't matter at all to anyone, except for that we got to see Seven without her face implant. Mm, the yeah. end. That's the episode. Did you like it? Overall thoughts and feelings. What's your vibe on this one? Hmm. <laughs> I'm still not sure. Mm. I, I'm what still not feeling? sure. I think one of the things I really enjoyed about this episode, and this is why I think it's in the liked it category, is that I really got to see the cr- like the crew in a unique way, mm-hmm. which is fun. Got to see Janeway being brilliant and present and in these different eras of like or not eras just years of like her time on Voyager but then I also got to kind of glimpse at what the Federation will do in the future to adjust timey-wimey stuff Mm. to quote Doctor Who. Doctor Who yeah nice well done. Thank you. (laughs) So I think that's interesting to kind of see this mm. ship relativity, which makes sense. We're Love talking. that. Yeah. Um, by the way, my predictions with the, this is going to have like a Thanksgiving thing. And I think that roast counts. <laughs> no, it does not. It fucking okay, sure let's, does. Let's, let's do the predictions first. Your predictions were um, this will be a Thanksgiving episode. With it was. Totally. A, a pot <laughs> roast does not a Thanksgiving make. Um, your other prediction was... Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, the episode will be about aging rapidly, which some people were aging more rapidly than others I on certain parts of the ship. I definitely no, saw people getting kind of like sick in my imagination, and I wish I just would have stuck with the that. Oh, because they were getting sick. They were yeah. getting sick. And when I was watching, I was like, this is this is kind of what I thought. But yeah. I said aging rapidly because that's sort of how I envisioned it specific, being interpreted yeah. related to time. But that, I guess, technically... My intention doesn't count, mm. so I just whiffed on those. You, you whiffed a pot, little bit, mainly, mainly with roast. <laughs> so one of the reasons, I, I mean, what what I what I noticed this time around watching this episode, and I've seen this episode a lot, is that is it is a super discount cause and effect. I couldn't stop comparing this to cause and effect after having watched it so much because there's not exactly a time loop. But Seven has to revisit certain things and prevent an explosion from happening and gather pieces of the puzzle as to what causes the explosion. There's a lot of elements that are the same, but it just doesn't have the magic that cause and effect does. Did you get that vibe at all, having recently seen cause and effect as well? I wasn't thinking about the comparison of it. I think I was just watching this one to watch it. And one of the but now that I'm comparing the two, one of the things I feel like this episode misses, if I'm going to, you know, look at them side by side, is the ticking time didn't really matter as much because we had this outside organization that can just beam you out and beam you back in. Like, mm. we got to see a fucking spaceship that has the ability to beam you into a specific place and <laughs> time. It's so broken. That's the most insane part of this episode. And it kind of removes the the element that cause and effect had where we felt the yes. pressure almost of the like th- this episode opens with a um your late cliche. Mm-hmm, and that's about course. the only pressure of time I felt this entire episode. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. oh no, she's late already way you know you definitely miss out on the tension from cause and effect but this is it's just an interesting shift in voyager because there's so much universe building that happens in deep space nine and voyager and voyager being stuck in the delta quadrant doesn't give the writers much opportunity to expand on the star trek universe in the delta quadrant it's all stuff that you never know if you're going to come back to it again so with this you have the uss relativity which is somewhere it is almost 500 years in the future so that that puts it somewhere in the 2800s so it's just really it's my favorite part of the episode you get to see a federation ship or a starfleet ship from the future it's a time ship federation they didn't say starfleet oh did they not oh okay good catch not that i heard yeah probably i don't probably not probably not but yeah, it's from the way, way in the future. I love the starship design. My fav- One of my favorite things, I'm such a nerd, 
is that you have not the L cars operating system, but if you see on the panel, there is on one of them, it says T cars. So it's time cars. That's the operating system that they use. And it's such a tiny, tiny little detail, but I love it when they get a chance to redesign like the interface that we're used to. You get a new uniform. Um, yeah, and a new starship. It's such a that's a big thing to take on in in one episode as well. It's a big undertaking. Yeah, that was kind of like the that was the episode breaking information is that it wasn't really our team figuring it out. It's this other entity interacting with our team. I thought that they did a clever job of starting off with something kind of wacky to in fact, when I was watching it, I, I thought, well, what I guess I made it back. Because I didn't realize this was in the past at oh, first. Oh, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I kind of thought that maybe in season five... Oh, that's five, interesting. When did you returned. figure it out? Well, it kind of became more obvious because we see seven and I thought, oh, okay, so this is... But then she was acting kind of like odd. Yeah. Not only that, but then when... So in the first sequence, she, uh, seven of nine, gets to the panel where this weapon has been planted and it goes into her perspective and it looked very Borg. So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, so she's still Borg, but she's not wearing her thing and she's yeah. talking to somebody else. What's going on in this, like in the space. But I again thought we were in the future. I thought that they had kind of like made that it back to Starfleet. If part of Voyager was actually set after they got home, that would be amazing. I'd love that. And but then also Janeway is discovering the ship. So I knew that there was something odd going on. Either yeah. we're looking at like a I thought it was maybe a dream sequence or something mm -hmm. like this. So I figured it out pretty quickly because there's a lot of context clues for us. But it was really interesting. And I think that would be fun for the audience. Like to what you were saying, they're stuck in sort of the Delta Quadrant, which is a fun place to explore. But mm -hmm. this is me seeing them with other Starfleet people. Like, yeah, it was so interesting because there's so much activity on Voyager. There's all these people that are fixing panels and there's all these carts and just so much um, like, I don't know. There's like a buzz that's sort of there with all the presence of these people mm. that when I've watched other episodes is lacking because they're just this tiny little crew trying to survive in the Delta Quadrant. So it's such a different um, energy to, yeah. to the ship. And I thought that was a really cool way to start it. And then, so I thought the writers did a good job because they kind of give us this new framework to sort of yeah. puzzle ourselves into. And then all of a sudden we're pulled out of that with Seven's death. And then rather than mm. explaining it, we go to Voyager modern day, which is yeah. when they're figuring out that there's this time crap happening. So then there's a new mystery to sort of solve. And then when they take seven that time, they explain it to her. So it's like they're explaining to us who the relativity ship is, what they're doing. And she's just like, yes, sir, like officer on duty. I'm going to go do whatever you want mm. to make sure that everybody's safe. And that's, I think, where I was just sort of like watching it. I, I checked the time at the halfway mark of this episode and I thought, uh oh. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh oh. I've already felt the pacing shift, and it was yeah. probably because the relativity ship removed some of it for me. But yeah. I think if I'm a Voyager fan, I like this episode because there's really like these little fun things that they do. For example, when Janeway first visits with the doctor, and he doesn't have a good mm. bedside manner, and then later on, he he's been reprogrammed to have that good bedside manner. What a well, fun he's kind of way. evolved it. Yeah, he's because this is in season five, so this is five ah, years yeah, true. in. Yeah. So it's it's my it, I said that the relativity is my favorite part, but the uh, my other favorite part is this revisit back to day one, one or pre day one. This is day minus yeah. one. Yeah, and it's such a you've got Janeway with her different hair. She has like the the hair. There's like this odd delineation. There's Janeway with her long hair up in the the beehive thing. And then there's Janeway with her bob. And that's like a clear... It's like Riker's beard, Riker doesn't have a beard. There's like that clear delineation in Voyager. So going all the way back and seeing like none of the McKee crew on the ship. This is a completely yeah. Starfleet crew. There's no integration. Mm -hmm. Um, You've got Janeway that's getting her first command. And it's so rare that we get to... I, I can't think off the top of my head. Another time when we see a captain the first time they come on board their ship. So when we start TNG, Picard is already on board. TOS, 
Pike and Kirk are already on board. Same with Strange New Worlds. We see Captain Sisko go on to Deep Space Nine, but he's not really happy to be there. So there's no oral wonder. He's like, this fucking hideous mining station. I don't want to be here. But Janeway, we get to see her go onto her bridge. We get to see her sit in her chair, geek out about all of the stats and stuff. That's such a smart thing. Considering you can go back in time to any point in the history of Voyager, it's really interesting to go back in time to a point, to this specific point. You're right, it gives the fans so much extra and just a little bit of opportunity to geek out. So, and to me, I think part of the episode too that feels different about cause and effect to kind of your point as far as comparison is that to me, my little plebeian brain, cause and effect ends in a way where I can understand a bit of the <laughs> of yeah. what happened. Like we were stuck Good in a time in- loop mm-hmm. and we figured it out. Good luck understanding any of the time travel in this. This episode ends <laughs> with it being just like a, literally Janeway says... Like, let's just get this over with. I already have a headache. I don't want it to get worse type mm-hmm. of a thing. Like, and, and that's sort of where I feel like most of the audience is going to go into that bucket of, I'm just watching this for fun. I'm it's not going to attempt to figure it yeah. out. I knew it was trying to address itself when part of Seven's training to be reintroduced into the timey wimeyness was an entire conversation on the different ways that you can impact a time loop. The different paradoxes. The different yeah. paradoxes. And I know many, many people who love to talk about time paradoxes and time things and the different ones. And Hello. then there's exactly. And for me, I don't give a fuck. I just want to watch it to have a good time. <laughs> so I kind of pull back and I go, was this one fun for me? Yeah. And I think the answer is not as fun because it got really convoluted at the end. Mm-hmm. And I had to it's pull messy. so far back out that I don't know that I was as invested as they wanted me to be. Because yeah. there's something about how there's multiples of this person and there's, but these people can be reintegrated into themselves. How does that work? We don't, we're not shown that. That's not, we no. have one seven and then we had the seven that was over here on this timeline. And are they going to beam themselves back together? And then they're going to be like, none of that is explained. None of that is addressed. So me caring for this time traveling seven mm. is gone. I don't care about her anymore because I guess I'm going to care more about the one that's playing ping pong. I don't know. Well, yeah, because we've already seen A7 die. It kind of doesn't matter if this 7 dies. I'm because confused. Because we still have our 7. So there's no real investment here. It's more like a, this is what happened on Relativity one day. And I kind of wonder if maybe, mm. you, you know what? Sometimes you have a conversation with somebody in your life and you walk away and you're like, what even matters anymore? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's right because, and this is why I get I give it this like discount cause and effect title in my head now because with the I enjoy the fluffiness and I I enjoy the fun, but you don't get the drama and the tension, and it doesn't have the same impact as cause and effect for me. So I yeah, know that yeah. like they're gonna survive at the end of cause and effect. I have no question that they're gonna find a solution. But I still feel it every time the ship blows up. I feel this, oh no, how are they going to do this? And I don't get any of that from this episode. Even though Braxton is being a dick. There's a part of it that's like, in cause and effect, and maybe even in this episode, there's an investment when our crew is trying to figure it out. Because each time that Janeway is trying to figure it out, I was really really present and I was like, ooh, what's she going to do? to figure this out and from the very first moment that there's a blip on the map of the zero or point zero zero three chroniton autonomy going on you say that with pride how do i do that just be proud be proud that you're saying the words chronicron flux yep is that is that more prideful or was that just louder (laughs) it was just louder (laughs) but i saw her and she's like and then so then it kind of felt like it was janeway versus relativity and i was Mm. liking that But that even sort of fizzles out because just as Janeway is attempting, like our modern Janeway is attempting to kind of talk to time travel seven, Mm. she's just beamed out. They, they, they neuter that moment of her having that revelation, zap her aboard, and then essentially say, you're going to travel back in time now because if you don't, then she's going to die. It's kind of crazy. They have this huge concept, but it's almost like they didn't know what how to fill the 45 minutes 
So you have like a lot of these um really like stop start moments where like seven intercepts Braxton, they have like the chase through the ship, they do the phasing, they capture him. But that's not the end of the episode because they have to kidnap Janeway and send her back to capture him again. But whereas cause and effect manages to repeat the same scenes over and over again, this episode itself even feels tired that it has to do this. So it's like, yeah, I guess we have to fix the timeline, but it rushes it in like the last few minutes. It's a like, different it just, way of fixing of feels... things. In cause yeah. and effect, they're attempt they they are having a realization over and over again. Mm-hmm. In relativity we have the ship that is going back at different points along the timeline to attempt to stop something from happening that shouldn't happen according yeah. to them. Right. And then we find out yeah. that it's Braxton, which to me wasn't really a surprise. I kind of saw that coming, but I, I, I think maybe am I missing something? Was Braxton part of the story before this episode? Like, have we seen him before? Yeah. So there's another, um, there's a two parter where basically a younger version of Braxton. So this is, he's like in his 20s or 30s or something. This is in season three. So way before this, he on a solo mission tries to prevent Voyager from doing something. He tries to destroy Voyager, but with permission because he believes or they believe that Voyager is going to end up destroying the entire Earth solar system at some point through an accident that happened. Long story short, they avoid it all. But as a result, he ends up stuck on Earth for 30 years because Janeway basically says, you can't blow up the ship. I'm not going to let you. They get into a bit of a fight. Voyager ends up in the past, but Braxton ends up even further in the past. So he has to live through the 60s, 70s and 80s on his own. And it drives him a bit loopy. Oh but my God, he eventually a white gets... male, what a, what a terrible thing to have to do. <laughs> terrible. So he gets reintroduced into um, society and gets given a command so this all happens after that so it's in the past for him and he's like i'm fine i'm over it i now have my own ship and then after this point he goes a bit lulu loopsy and decides to blow up voyager before any of that can happen it does this this episode also leans heavily on the audience's ability to keep track of not just one person's time but like mm. six people's time, it feels like. Yeah. And maybe it's only just two or three, but it feels bigger than that. It feels like, okay, so Janeway is actively being adjusted and what she remembers because the time jumps are going in different points on yes. this episode. So yeah. she's remembering that this happened once before, but when she gets back to her timeline, she's going to remember it like three times happening and by it, I mean either the chronoton flux or seeing seven or whatever we've got glowing, yeah. going on because we're messing with it. So we've got Janeway and what she would remember. We've got seven and what she would remember. Then we've got Braxton and what he would remember. And then we've got his uh, first officer and what he would mm. remember. It's and so, so it's messy. A lot. It's, it's a really messy. And I think that's part of what the simplicity of cause and effect versus the complexity yes, of relativity. Exactly. And I'm not upset by complexity. Um, I think that they did some things really well in this episode, but to to really rush the end, mm. I got like I'm having I'm having a hard time understanding my investment in it. Like, yeah. what, what do I take away from this episode except for the knowledge that relativity exists, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a bit of fun. Like, there's a there's a fun phaser fight in it. We get to see the temporal transporters seven going through time. We get to revisit. The Kazon attack, we get to see Voyager um, in its, like, in dry dock at the very beginning. And just inherently for me, time travel is fun, even it is if fun. the paradoxes don't make any sense at the end. And that's what separates good time travel episodes from outstanding, excellent ones, um, is when you can kind of tie it all up in a, in a bow as well. Um, but it's never, it's never going to make complete sense. But this in particular is some real nonsense because yeah i think it's trying to do this branching timeline thing yeah. but it doesn't fully accept what branching timelines mean because they exist regardless of what you fix or what you don't fix this is mm. kind of mm. going with the loki thing of a sacred timeline yeah where this is this one thing that we have to converge and get back to when they get to the end and they're like yeah there's three braxtons on the bridge right now <laughs> Yeah, it's like there's one there's one that you've got to catch there's one on the transporter pad and then there's a third one in the brig 
<laughs> you have to reintegrate them all. At that point, really, I was just like, I don't really care. I know that things are yeah. just going to magically be okay next episode. So I'm going to pull back and mm-hmm. I'm going to go, what did I really love? And that relativity ship was so cool looking. And it so must have cool. been even better looking you know, when this ep- when these episodes came out, just as far as comparison, yeah. there was some really interesting stuff on the screens there, not just with how they were trying to show us where the timeline was being adjusted, but the panels were just this sort of like blue tones and mm-hmm. circles Love the design. and very much complicated. Their, their tricorders looked a little bit more modern and even their clothing looked different. A funky and- phaser as well. I enjoyed that. Of course, I enjoyed, like I said earlier, like looking back on what the Voyager was like before it got launched and then what the ship was, you know, like day to day, figuring things out as they were going. There was a mystery going on. So there was a lot of things to kind of enjoy, but it was all like just happening at once. And oh, yeah, the the ship, the exterior of the relativity looked pretty Mm -hmm. freaking cool to me at least. I can see it being an evolution into the future of what starships might look like. It's really fun. Yeah. Although I question why they need a starship, but I will get to that in the sins specifically. <laughs> um, there's a couple of really nerdy things that I like, and we just get a little we get a little glimpse of Lieutenant Kerry, um, who is the oh, engineer yes. that yes. Seven of Nine talks to. Possibly the most disrespected character in all of Star Trek history, in my opinion. So Kerry is by all rights, he should be the chief engineer of Voyager. So when Voyager ends up in the Delta Quadrant, the chief engineer dies, gets killed immediately. Um, Kerry is the essentially the replacement, but gets instead, Belana ends up being chief engineer, who is part of the McKee crew, and it's kind of a peace offering. Like, she's incredible. She's great. She's got Starfleet training. She's good at the job. But Kerry's kind of like, she just gets shit on. And like... Belana punches him in the face and breaks his nose. Seven of Nine does something similar at some point, I think. Anyway, he gets pooped on and then is forgotten. Like, they just stop writing him stuff to do. He doesn't even appear. And then eventually returns in se- he returns in this episode. And then he returns in season seven where they just kill him. Like, he just gets... He doesn't get killed off screen, but the actor just gets forgotten gotten about for like seven years and then they just bring him back and say you're dead it's, just, it's so interesting that he of all people pops up in this episode it's really interesting yeah i mean that's the fun part about i think people who like watch a particular series and um get really into like they really enjoy it is there's a little bit of easter egg feel in this episode that i think would be kind of fun and i feel yes, like that's, it's that's very what they leaned into in yeah. this was Like what would and then also uh, answering the fan question of well what would Seven look like if she was in a Starfleet uniform? Let's and doesn't I love her in a Starfleet uniform? It's the same thing with like when they eventually put Diana in a Starfleet uniform. I'm like it's just better than the cat suits and the onesies and and better is subjective, but it just I like that they're in they're in uniform as well. The reason that they weren't in uniform felt a little bit 80s and icky it didn't feel like it was serving any other purpose than to essentially have a bit of sex appeal so having them in uniform was always like it always felt really cool yeah kind of like you know just seeing a female form a beautiful female form of course but one that only 0.003 chronoton flux of human beings can look like yes exactly very specific very very specific um so yeah see in, and in science has made sense as well it's kind of like what's this alternate history that seven could have had had her parents not been selfish bastards and got her assimilated um so yeah very 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 interesting um anything else ambassador any other positives 52861.274 delta quadrant 87 theta by 271 target uss voyager hmm was that an interesting note no <laughs> no but i love his delivery i love his delivery of all of those like calm set setting for he kind yeah. of has a kirky delivery to the time travel stuff i didn't catch the kirk part of it but it was interesting because again the curiosity of what the ship is doing the fact that they can just take somebody well and they were being so casual with with life too you know you've got mm. oh my goodness this we'll beam her out again don't worry bigger stakes are at play here guys we you know if she dies she dies we'll just pull her out of the timeline again and that casualness of playing with 
time brings a lot of questions for me. I guess the question I have is, do we see the relativity again? Uh, no, to the best of my knowledge, we never see That's the relativity it? again. That's it. Holy we don't shit. come back to it. We don't. Is this the first so, and last time then? First and last time, yeah. Wow. So, there are time ships and time agents, and that happens more in Enterprise, which is a prequel series, but was made after Voyager, and they do this whole time warp thing, um, <laughs> where I think the Enterprise <laughs> J is a time traveling ship of some sort. But anyway, no, we do not see the relativity again. Interesting. Sadly. I want a season in the 2800s. I don't know how I feel about not seeing the ship again. It kind of makes me feel like they knew that they fucked something up. <laughs> right? I would love to see it again. I'd love to have a Star Trek Relativity TV show. Not with Brian so, though. New crew. So at this point, season five of Voyager, you know, I'm getting the impression that they had messed with time a bit too much and time travel a bit too much. Is that, that's what the tiny people said. They're like, hey, Janeway, quit, quit it. it. Stop So how now. many, how many time travel episodes do you suspect there had been at, at this point in the series not oh, in voyager not star trek just voyager yeah because oh just they, in voyager yeah they i think he lists them all there's uh timeless which has happened by now that's the one where um harry and chakotay try to prevent voyager from being destroyed so there's and they mess around and geordie like tries to prevent them and he is like no we're gonna go back in time and we're gonna stop the frozen voyager from dying in the ice and whatnot so braxton implies that he kind of cleans up the loose ends that happen because harry and chakotay do change the past like there's no getting around it they prevent voyager from crashing um and keep them in the delta quadrant so i think there's been three there's been three or four different time episodes that have happened at this point okay and it's assumed so, that the relativity cleans it up. So that's the thing, right? That's that's almost like at some point in the writer's room, they're like, we we have fucked with time too much and we need to explain we need ourselves. Reason. Yes, I think you're right. Yeah. And so we need to have an episode that addresses that. And so they come up with, well, what if there is this organization in the future? Let's have an episode where we kind of like button all of that up and try to mm -hmm. explain how that works without actually trying to get into too much of explaining how it works. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't I mean that's exactly what it is because you can blame it on future tech and just like yeah, no, no, we fix all of this, it's fine. What's interesting is that in Strange New Worlds, when you've uh, in Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, when Laan does the time travel stuff and she's visited by a time agent oh, at yeah. the very end of the episode, I just wish she'd said that she was from like the Relativity or something or like I can't, I don't think she's wearing the same un. In fact, I'm almost positive she's not wearing the same uniform, but. There is an implication that she's from the same time police that um, that we know from Voyager. Well, I love that. It's really fun. I yeah. think in a series, anything that Star Trek is doing, maybe they need to have something that kind of allows them to have fun with yeah. storytelling and time travel, but then also tries to keep it on the rails. And mm -hmm. if this episode did anything, it is introduce the rails a little bit, even though That's it maybe doesn't to put it explain it all yeah. it's okay i'm a, like i said i'm a little bummed that it doesn't come back round but well and that's there's what would still make it so sing. much more star trek that hopefully we made maybe somebody yeah. will kind of explore what it's like and watching this episode can kind of prepare us for that again my, my mind is blown mm -hmm. that they're just beaming people into time that's just Temporal fucking crazy beaming is just insane and how are you like are you just policing starfleet are you policing the romulans like I can't imagine the complexity of, of being the relativity and the time police and the job that they have to do. And like, how do they even observe these things like in a linear fashion? Because time yeah. is happening all at once from their yeah. perspective. All of history has already happened. Well, and so clearly they have so blinders because even the captain himself doesn't know that in the future he's going to do something. So oh, and they're I stuck in time that. in a weird way where it's like we yeah. can see the past, but not the future. And what, what is that? look like so so, so in introducing this rail it introduces a whole other array of questions that 
would mm-hmm. potentially impact how any of this makes sense. But this yeah. is sci-fi and storytelling. And I think mm-hmm. I'm trying to remove some of the frustrations there and just have fun with it. So I think the answer to your original question is I like this episode, but it's definitely not like one that I'm going to be wanting to watch again. Cause I don't think something happened in this enough that blew my mind as much as it's an interesting, an interesting official entry in Star Trek's canon about mm. how time stuff works and that there are people and there are organizations in place that are going to come in yeah. and do like you like mentioning Loki is perfect. If you haven't watched the TV series Loki, it does a really good job in my opinion of taking you through I think two seasons yeah. of the character Loki from the Marvel series sort of stuck in a world dealing with timelines and it's and be, it spends two seasons kind of putting Loki in the situation of trying to figure out the the, the organization that exists mm-hmm. to keep time on the rails and yeah. what happens when it goes off the rails and the repercussions of all of that. And does it answer all of the questions? No, because no. tiny whininess is, uh-huh. it's just such sci-fi. It's such a fantasy part of our brain. So kudos to the show for doing what it did. Um, I just think it got a little bit too messy at the end. It does the TVA before Loki. Did the TVA. Yeah, the TVA. You know what it feels like? This episode kind of feels like when you decide to leave a, a mess uncleaned because yeah. you just can't handle it. Like, I went into the kitchen and so I cleaned it and it's yeah. perfect. It's all in good condition. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to cook something in here. <laughs> and rather than clean the kitchen and leave it in the same way that it was when I went yeah. in, I'm like, I'm just going to come back to this later. Mm-hmm. And that's what this episode feels like. It ends messier than it began. And you just yeah. have to walk away from it and hope that the next Much time you like cook, Jane somebody Wei. else cleaned it up. <laughs> Janeway just has to walk away from this episode completely. And she does. I, I get like, I, I, I come away from it having a good enough time where I forgive it. But it does take it down a couple of notches for sure. Yeah, definitely like a two and a half, two, two and a half pips maybe. Yeah, I think I would give it two pips. But I, it's only because I'm comparing it to cause and effect now so much in my breath. That's why I love doing this because... I'm not throwing this on because it's fun today. I'm throwing it on because I want to I want to analyze it. So yeah, interesting, interesting way to look at it. A couple of other really nerdy things that I absolutely screamed about um the opening to the sh- to the to the show with the ships in the dry dock. They didn't just put a couple of ships in dry dock. There is so many ships. Oh, that here. was so neat. I loved we that. We get the Akira class on ship, which I think we'd only seen in first contact. Um, there's a couple of galaxy classes around. I think there was a nebula class. There's, I giggled at the shuttle. So much fun. I was like, look at the, the little, little shuttle. shuttle. <laughs> Love it. Just some amazing glory shots that I loved. Um, First Contact, the movie, also gets a shout out where Seven of Nine has to give an example of a paradox and gives First Contact's plot as the example. Uh, and I, I just, I really love the, um, so you could say that the, the formation of Starfleet is owed to the Borg, and she's just like, "Yeah, you're welcome." Amazing, so so good. Um, and yeah, I love the evolution of the tricorder as well. You get like this really thin, dainty tricorder that. I oh, can you kind mean of, the razor? The ra- It's very very. Thin. It's a Motorola razor. It is a Motorola razor. <laughs> this came first. Motorola razor stole from Star Trek. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's everything. I think the only time I felt the pacing was when Tom is talking about the fucking ping pong tournament. I'm like, we could have lost two minutes there. I, I just cut straight to the ping pong. <laughs> mm. Give me two more minutes of space porn rather than the ping pong um, thing. Just get straight into the game and then the ping pong freezes in midair. Yeah, what does fun. that ping pong moment do in the hallway? Except for to remind set us up. about... Yeah, it's all set up. Yep. There's nothing. I don't think it really gives us anything at all because it's not setting up like... It doesn't increase the relation. It kind of makes seven more friendly i guess here's here's what it does it reminds us that in our most desperate bored time of being completely removed from society ping pong is what we revert to survives (laughs) ping pong not only survives it becomes the thing to do to prove yourself to master yeah it is 2300 and we are testing humanity what yeah. A, yeah, yeah. Also a, insane that Seven of Nine doesn't dominate these fools. Like, she's not completely Borg anymore, but she's a lot better than humans. <laughs> Amazing. 
Well, I think we've covered all of that there. Should we go and do some sins? Let's do it. Battle stations, red alert. Warning. Warp core collapse in 10 seconds. This is the part of the show where we remind ourselves that no TV shows without sin, even our beloved Star Trek. Ambassador, give us some sins, and I promise I will not go too deep on the time travel stuff. Um, You know, I... Uh... I already mentioned my the the one of the only ones I really wrote down, um, which was the cliche that happens in storytelling where it starts mm-hmm. off with you're late. But I guess I should probably jump into the idea that the fur when when he orders a hug, I cringed. Oh, so did I. But I, guess- I don't I don't think people are aware of how frequently in storytelling I women specifically are kind of forced to hug other people yeah i don't it's something i've become more aware of as i've gotten older especially as i've got a daughter now and i'm just like wanting her to know that she doesn't have to physically touch other people or be touched by other people Mm -hmm. if she doesn't want to and one of the things that happens is just like you know go give him a hug and i just don't understand why that's a thing and maybe it's because i'm really like tired of being told like now as as an adult people don't tell me that anymore but all mm. growing up, it's just like you're expected to go like hug people. And I realized yeah. years back that I actually don't like it. <laughs> and I've never been given the opportunity to just not. It, so, I, for me, yeah, yeah, I think it should be reserved more. Like we, I mean, handshakes are gross, but handshakes are there for a reason. Like that, you literally keeping people at arm's length. Hugs are, I think, given out too frequently as well. Yeah. I kind of agree. I, I, mean, I know it's a, it's super nitpicky and weird, but that's kind of the point of this part of the show but like yeah for this guy to be like and now i order you to give me a hug and it just is like oh. yeah. and i guess we don't know a lot about their relationship like they it could be a lot closer very friendly, doesn't it yeah it's probably a lot closer than we're we're getting but yeah also the 90s yeah the 90s but um i honestly to be honest with you i don't have very many sins for this whole section because mm-hmm. i i didn't I was just watching it. And I feel yeah. like the sins of this are going to be about time travel or they're going to be about weird things I'm not going to realize. Like uh, like we could talk about like them running through the hallway and not recognizing each other or, you know, Bolana sees Janeway with different hair and I didn't. It's so like, dumb. Maybe, there's, they're also in red alert. Maybe her hair fell out. I don't know. Like there's, there's it ways. Fell that out her, and became shorter. <laughs> well, she doesn't know how long it is, does she? Unless it comes down, I guess, I guess. It's super anyway, long in the first season. I don't I don't like have it a lot, um, but the chat has a bunch, so <laughs> Yeah, you you can pull from the chat. I will just do a brief bit on the time travel. No, it doesn't make any sense. And the crux of it for me is that when he figures out that Braxton is the the person that's gonna blow up Voyager and he arrests him and puts him in the brig, I don't see what else there is to fix. Like, once you've arrested him. That's the preventative work that you need to do. Because now that you've arrested him, you've prevented the thing from 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 happening. He can't go back in time and do that. Because if you're admitting that that doesn't work, that means that branching timelines are a thing. And the butterfly effect is a thing, which means you cannot fix all yeah. of the branches. Because all they do is go back in time to a point where Braxton beams onto the ship and he can't and he and prevent him from placing the weapon. Well, guess what? You're going the only difference between that and stopping him while he's still captain is going back in time even more. Because this is still the same Braxton that's in command of relativity. You're just stopping him on Voyager instead of stopping him on relativity. So mm-hmm. if that if putting him in the brig works, then you don't need to send Janeway back yeah. to stop him when he beams onto Voyager. That is yeah. that's the part that I cannot reconcile in my head. I think I was reaching for that when I got to the end of the show and I was like, wait, what about what about and then it's just like what about so much just keep rolling back why is relativity not just stopping them from going out into the delta quadrant do they get to decide that something that voyager does in the delta quadrant is worthwhile for them to do for the great of the federation there's so many questions that this brings up like that sacred timeline thing is never really explained yeah you could stop so much unless it's something that needs to happen and then but preventing the death of the ship needs to happen for future but like, stuff i don't i guess why stop him why not stop him when he's making the bomb like the braxton that you yeah. have 
he's like, I'll be on deck for section 23. I'll trip over somebody. Why not say, I get the bomb from this dickhead. Yeah. Stop me then. Then you don't have to do right. much time travel at all. And why believe that Braxton at all? Yeah. Like, what does that Braxton... Is it... I don't know. It, it resolves it's just, itself. It's, yeah. it's so, so... It's, it is literally because there are 10 minutes left of the episode and we're not entirely sure what we're going to do with them. So we're going to send Janeway on another mission. And it's it's it really breaks my brain thinking about why they believe stopping Braxton at this point in time is better than stopping him in just stopping him on relativity. And the fact that they're proud of Janeway... For- Oh, only a 0.37 variance. I was expecting more. She spoke to Balana on the way. Like, she did a terrible job. You just had to not talk to anybody. Just hide, or at least give her a wig. Like, that variance, I feel like, should be way higher. And the fact that they're, like, even measuring the variance means that they know the butterfly effect is a thing. And you just can't. You can't time travel and not stop the future. You just have these branches that you won't be able to control. Like, the more I think about it, the more I believe that Loki does a great job of explaining how time travel works and doesn't work and how broken, how broken it is. And you would need this MacGuffin to keep all of the strands yeah. in this loom. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right about that. I and, and strange that we're talking about Loki so much, except for that this episode introduces like a sacred timeline that the relativity is attempting to protect yeah somehow. kind of nudges at that and that's yeah. really not explored but loki really explores that so mm-hmm. um interesting don't uh, worry everything will go back to normal <laughs> here's here is a one from the chat from david who says neelix actually counts the point against harry and balana after the temporal anom- anomaly freezes the ball for several seconds and i cry foul <laughs> I- <laughs> that's amazing i hadn't thought about that that's so harsh Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's not okay. You're yeah, right. Yeah, he does look that's down at sin. his pad and like no yep. says like you dick. Which is actually kind of a funny comedy beat when you think about it. No, it actually is. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, my next one was just the pure EMH disrespect. And this is a scene for the entirety of season one and season two of Voyager, where we were clearly at a point where we're okay with this emergency hologram operating on people, saving our lives, but Instead of being nice out of a matter of course, it's like, this thing doesn't really exist. It doesn't think we can just be rude to it. That's fine. Why not be nice to it anyway? And the, this the is, equivalent this is, is as like, our civilization is embracing AI. <laughs> yeah, I, this is why I'm more and more putting it in the internet that I respect AI rights and mm-hmm. I will be polite. And thank you, Google. Mm-hmm. Like um, your future generations of children are going to be like, and it's because of our great, 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 great grandpa Ian saying this yeah. this one time that we still exist. Thank you, AI some, overlords. <laughs> yep, some modicum of human decency, and mm-hmm. I will take credit for all of it. But I will. I just can't get out of my brain that maybe in 20, 2060, 2070, we'll look back and be like, yeah, but it was the 20s. Like, they didn't know any better. Because of the way we talk about mm-hmm. computers and holograms not being real life and whatnot. And I'm just like, eh, don't give us a pass. We know better just because it's the 20s. There was a couple <laughs> people in the chat that basically send uh, Sci-Fi Brony and David again um, that the WebMDing exists in the 24th century. That was oh, pretty funny. We need to show you some um, Barclay episodes. Um, yeah, the poor, the poor guy. And you have so many more diseases to choose from in the future. you got some alien diseases to choose from as well. Um, why well, I had a big one where Janeway just says an absolute fuck you to the Temporal Prime Directive, which she knows exists. Like, the Temporal Prime Directive is a thing. And she's just like, she, she believes that Seven is from the future. And Tuvok is just like, yeah, there's... I mean, there's no way to prove it, but this could be right. And Janeway just digs her heels in and it's just like, you tell me to hell with the timeline. I don't care if it unravels all of reality. Tell me what's happening on my shit. And it's not like she's being asked to do anything unreasonable. She's just like, I'm going to stop Voyager from blowing up. And Janeway's just like, nope, nope, I must know. I must know. And it's so arrogant. I'm just like, you're a bad captain, Janeway. There was a there was a sin mentioned in the chat about Neelix 
making a call in the mess hall. The doctor goes to the mess yes. hall to answer the call, gets there early, which, by the way, I really enjoyed that part. Yes, that was clever. really fun. I wanted more of that. I did too. And this is the sin, is that they didn't really extend that moment where the doctor then turns to Neelix and says, okay, now send the message. Yeah, you have to send the message or else I won't come here. And that's so, that's that's the missing part in this episode. And you have like Chakotay who does like the time warp across the room. I would rather have 10 more minutes of different time fuckery. But they are so chill about, well, in 10 forward, it's, sorry, on in the mess hall, it's this time. And in sick bay, it's this time. They're so, like, happy about it. And just, like, this is a really fucked up thing that's happening right now. This is really serious and fucked up and weird. And they gloss over it so quick. And I do have, a, a in that moment, another sin. It, when he pulls up the time display, there's a seven-minute difference between sick pay sick bay and the mess hall why did it take the doctor seven minutes to get from anywhere on the ship to where there's a medical emergency like i just feel like seven minutes is so long to get to a medical emergency i thought he got there quickly but then it was just seven minutes in a different i guess it was in the wrong no, way because he hasn't sent the message yet so it had to because the crew doctor gets there and then a minute later the crewman passes out which is when uh neelix makes the call so let's say it's six minutes it's still a long time for him to get to a medical emergency like why don't you use the transporters but there we go here's one from flyboy who says this braxton remembers his exile on 20th century earth when oh, braxton man. at the so end confusing. of futures end says sorry i was never a part of that timeline so yeah sin, as always is time travel I thought about that because the Braxton at the end of Future's End, it hasn't happened to him, but it has happened to this Braxton. Well, and that's what I... this episode seems to do too, because it even happens with Janeway, where by the time that this episode ends, our Janeway now would have multiple injected memories that have been impacting her this entire time. But then you at the same think. time, is it because she's pulled out that she doesn't? And it doesn't really explain any of that. Doesn't explain any of that at all. Nope. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else did I have? This is such a dumb nitpicky sin. So this is at the beginning of the episode, and Seven is Seven is in the Jeffrey's tube. She's found the bomb. Uh, the captain, uh, Captain Janeway, and the Admiral are at the door, and Janeway says the door is locked from the other side. I'm like, how does that work on a sliding door? Like this, this is like a fucking latch. Like it's locked on both sides because Seven has locked. She didn't like. There's not like a a bar that she's put across the handle. This is a smooth sliding door that the computer has locked it is locked from both sides because you're on a spaceship there is no like you don't go around like the other side of the deck and you're just like oh no it's unlocked from this side it's locked just it's locked that's it Nerd. Nerd. uh sin from the chat the biggest sin of this episode is lieutenant duquesne saying try and avoid time travel admiral janeway doesn't remember this advice because we would have avoided the worst parts of endgame my, mm, yeah, yeah. Janeway does not follow this advice. Does she even remember it? And I guess that's part of what the episode doesn't really yeah. talk about with like, what did they call it? Like the reintroduction or whatever they were calling it at yeah. the end of the episode. This sort of, I, I and, and I'm left to assume that that means that they're going to somehow be merged back. The reintegration. I don't know how that works. Somehow being merged back in with themselves, nope. maybe. And if you have this reintegration thing, I don't. Again, don't know why you have to send Janeway to fight to find Braxton because you're yeah. just reintegrating a Braxton that hasn't done the things he's going to do yet. It's and really if you're going weird. back in time to prevent him, bottom line, like you shouldn't have to go back in time to prevent him yeah. if keeping future Captain Braxton in the brig works. <gasps> Insane. Insane. Um, what else did I have? I guess the last one I had was I really don't understand how temporal psychosis works because they're saying that if they keep taking Seven out of her timeline, all versions of Seven get fucked. Like they all experience yeah. some blurred yeah, that vision. Was, yeah. How does That's that a really work? Good question because when she dies, then and the show kind of starts, our quote unquote, our Seven of Nine is experiencing blurry vision. Yeah. Why is she it, at a different level of psychosis to the seven that's already died? It's, it's, it's so really confusing, confusing to me. Yeah. Yeah. And why is it cumulative? These are different sevens. Like, <laughs> you're now saying that there is some ethereal link between all of us at different points in our timeline. So, yeah, it's it's not. It introduces something that it answers, yeah. asks way more questions than it answers. It does. It 
that's it for me. I mean, there's yep. there's always more to kind of get into, but I think we've oh, kind of hit Oh, I spend absolutely years talking about how much of the time travel in this episode doesn't make sense. But, damn it, time travel episodes, it immediately, it like, for me, an episode starts at 70% awesome if it has time travel in it. And then it's just whether it gets up to 100% like cause and effect or like 75% like relativity. And that's the best way that I can like explain it. I think I'm not ever going to look for a perfect explanation of time travel because I don't know that I've seen a conversation where it's like, oh, that was really good. Except for Loki. A lot of good conversations around Loki. But yeah, totally and even agree. cause and effect. I didn't mind that one. I kind of like that one. I you think what I look for effect. is just good storytelling. Just yeah. something where by the end, I'm feeling really like excited about what happened. This one just left me with more questions than I think yeah. I want to have at the end of mm-hmm. an episode. Totally get it. Like, show me what it means to re to reintegrate. Yeah, what does that what mean? What does that mean? I wanted to see Janeway beamed into Janeway. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? Just to come back to Doctor Who, they do that in the Doctor Who episode where they have five different Doctors, well, four interact with each other and at the end one of the assistants is just like wait you're all getting into the same tardis how are you going to get back to your own yeah, timeline little, little and they, they they press some buttons and then all of the different tardises just disappear and go yeah. away into their own time zones yeah. i love it it's yeah. great anyway if you want the time travel to make sense you should not listen to next week's episode as we're going to visit tos and watch tomorrow is yesterday. So we're going back to one of the very tomorrow rare time travel episodes in the original series. That's season one, episode 19 slash 18, depending on whether they're counting the pilot or whatnot. But yes, next week's episode will be the original series. Tomorrow is yesterday. And until next week, hey, send us an audio, send us a message, send us your amazing doodles of us if you so wish or please um, to captainspod at cinemasins.com on x slash, slash Twitter, um, which is at captainspodcs, or join the Cinemasins Discord um, and go to the Captain's Pod channel where you can do all sorts of things, especially hang out with fellow Star Trek nerds. And that's discord.gg slash cinemasins. And there is a growing group of nerds thank you for gathering so many we love you all you're the best um yeah and until next week um you try being funny after 36 cases of space sickness yeah you know what i'm really looking forward to it. no rather backward to it <laughs> and pods for long live and that wasn't right <laughs> no thanks for listening want to connect with the show our hailing frequencies are always open through captain's pod at cinemasins.com Like, comment, and subscribe on your podcast player of choice, and be sure to visit cinemasins.com. Click to update to a new version of the app. I'm clicking and nothing is happening! Really, this is the perfect time to start a show because my next level chef episode had somebody putting something like lamb's tongue on a pizza. I just really don't, I don't want to, I don't want that to be real. I'm watching Ink Master and I just forgot about it. Oh my God, I did. I forgot about watching Ink Master. Don't tell them. They can't know. Who am I talking to? Nobody. I'm talking to you, outtakes people. Gotta get there before Danae. Because the funny shit is when she's late. Shit, she beat me here. Fuck. Captain's pod. Captain's pod. Waiting on the captain for Captain's pod. Captain's pod. Captain's pod. Waiting on the captain for captain's pod. Woo-woo. <laughs> you have got to listen to the outtakes when I edit this one together. Because I was just singing my Gotta Get to StreamYard before the ambassador song. <laughs> Your song loses out to cap my song. Yeah. Does this time. So I had this big like, cleaning up day with, yesterday, uh, with Iris yesterday for her, her room. Mm-hmm. So she has this like little section for her keepsakes. And I was explaining what keepsakes are. So she had like mm, birthday cards oh no. from last year. Don't teach her that. I'm not teaching her anything. Teach her to let go. Sir, can you let me speak? Because you're going to be excited to hear that both things can exist, I think. She had this like piece of paper, this like uh, card that she really liked it reminded her of something and she says i want to keep this and i said well what if we have a little thing of keepsakes where you can kind of go through them and have memories but they're not taking up space and she said Mm. okay and so 
I got like a little container and then we put this card down in there, but then we pulled down six or seven other things and she's like, no, I don't want that as a keepsake. So she only oh, kept, nice. yeah, she only kept like maybe three paper things. Mm-hmm. One of the things that didn't make it was your parents' birthday card to her. Sorry. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't even tell you how complicated my relationship is with giving cards. I capital hate giving, (laughs) writing, spending my hard-earned money on cards, greeting cards. I despise it. And I used to manage a card shop. (laughs) Not the worst job I've ever had, but fundamentally, as as a against my character, it was the most hypocritical I felt in my life because I had to be passionate about greetings cards and if it was up to me the industry wouldn't exist anymore like go out of business it was like I hired like I was I made sure I got hired so I could take them down from the inside (laughs) I'm not done ranting about the card shop either you would you have you want to know you want to talk about wastage and wasting things card shops and i know they try because i've done it i've been there card shops are the most wasteful business i've ever been in because cards are so cheap and you you could you spend like this was like a premium card shop so the cards were like five six seven pound each for card so because the markup is so high they don't really give a shit about throwing them away so at christmas none of that gets kept a, some of it gets kept for the next year a small small piecemeal offering everything else bins and bins and bags and bags and skips of wasted paper it is so wasteful insane and it's kind of wild that they still go out of business even though they're literally selling pieces of card for six pounds a time it is ludicrous Fame. <laughs> I used to so that song used to play at Toys R Us. This is just the what did Ian used to do podcast at the minute. Um that song used to play at Toys R Us when I was like 16, 17. And I I didn't know the song. I wasn't very familiar with Bowie at the time. And I thought the song just said Babe. <laughs> babe. <laughs> What's up, man in front of the Great lyrics. Babe. Babe, 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 babe. Getting lyrics wrong is just something that happens to everybody. And I feel like there are so many great stories of people singing the wrong thing. Like, didn't you have another one? You have some really good ones. What was the other one that you had that was... um? Oh, oh, it's... Um, um, yeah, that's what was, the one. What, 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 what do you think? Shut up. Was, doesn't what? matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> stupid song anyway it's a god when i realized it was a god song i was like god damn it <laughs> give me three days I along this it. road that i must travel I give me three days give me just three, three days along this road <laughs> just three just no. give me three days fucking just, hell just give me three days of peace this song is about drive time this is one that really annoys dice around i never change it especially when we're playing poker um it's um now I can't remember which one's the right one and which one's the wrong one. That's how much it's in my head. It you never count your you never count your blessings when you're sitting at the table. What's the actual lyrics? You never count. What's the song? <laughs> I'm gonna let you just flail on this one. Damn it! I think the actual line is you never count your blessings. No. Yeah. No. No. I think the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me what it is. I'm dying no. over here. It's you're talking about. Like, um, no, no when, when to no hold them. Hold them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No when to walk away. No when to run. <laughs> you never count your blessings when you're sitting at the table, is what I think it is. And it, it isn't. Doesn't, it's not. Yeah. It, it's count your money. <laughs> that doesn't, yeah, no, that's it. Because both of them make sense to me. Both In my head, both of them make sense. Like, you never count your blessings. Because you don't. Don't count your blessings when you're sitting at the table. You never know. You don't know what's going to happen. But specifically, this is a poker game. And so counting your blessings at a poker table doesn't seem to make as much Uh, sense. Metaphor much, Danae? (laughs) (laughs) The last time I played poker with Aaron, I'm sat two people along from him. 
And I'm just humming. And he hates and he it. Just, he eyeballs me because he's like, I know you're humming the wrong words. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't hum the wrong words. I'm humming the same thing. Yeah. Money, blessings, same syllables. You can't same. tell. You mm-hmm. can't tell. You don't know. You don't know. They'll, there'll be. That's one of my favorites. There'll be. There'll be plenty of time for praying. There'll, there'll be time enough for counting oh, when the dealing's done. Not not praying. Did you say praying? Yeah, there'll be time enough for praying. I love how I've made... Blessings I've made and praying. Yeah, I've made Kitty Elaze on a traveling commuting song, and I've made whatever that other poker the song gambler, is religious. The Gambler, I think it's called. The Gambler. Yeah. yeah, I've made that a religious song. That's very on brand. Insane. Insane. Hey, Danae, can I derail our pre-show thing by mm-hmm. doing a trick or triction that's been sent in by a listener? Of course. So a long, 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 long time ago in a galaxy far, um, we um, threw out trick or triction to you guys. And we've had some replies. And we're going to do Sci-Fi Bronies reply, who has put this together. Uh, I've modified it very, very slightly with Sci-Fi Bronies' permission. And I believe they are in the live chat as well. So, very, very briefly, Danae, in here. for, for Trek or Triction, I'm, right I'm going to give you yeah, I'm ready. the series and episode title. Okay. okay. And then it's going to be in three parts, beginning, okay. middle, and end. Okay. And you have to tell me which one is the Trek and which one is the Triction. Trick or Triction, the epi- the series is TNG. The episode is entitled Justice. Justice, okay, all right, a. I'm ready. The Enterprise is visiting a planet to establish dis- diplomatic relations, but accidentally vaporizes the atmosphere when the warp drive malfunctions. B, the Enterprise violates the Prime Directive to take shore leave on a sex planet, including Wesley. I forgot how Trick or Triction works. You have to tell me whether A or B is the Trek. Which okay. Which is true. Okay. Which one is false? I mean, obviously it's B. There's no way that you're going to put that in front of me and, and that not be true. The Enterprise violates the Prime Directive to take shore leave on a sex planet, including Wesley. Correct. You are correct. Yeah. That is the trick. Yeah. That's that just, is the opening th- to this episode. This is just logical. This was, yeah. this is me knowing you're, you're going to put that in front of me thinking like, oh no, it wouldn't be that. But no, 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 no. It's going to be that. Sci-fi brony. This is sci-fi brony. But yes. Good, good logic. Violating the Prime Directive. This this planet, as far as we know, does not have warp travel, but we're going to go down there because they're all naked and sexy and giving us massages. As one does. Part two. A. Wesley must face the death penalty for a baseball accident involving crushed flowers. Yes. B. Wesley must face the death penalty because the romance of the week is between him and the alien leader's daughter, but because she is promised to the son of another leader as part of a diplomatic relations with another planet in the system. The question is, would this show actually like do a relations with Wesley or would they would they then be like, you know, we're going to have Wesley go to a sex planet. But then to make up for it, it's just going to be about baseball. You know, like it's not going to be super sexy. It's just going to be you're technically in the vicinity and then fuck something up. Mm -hmm. To be fair, they're not showing sex with anyone like romantic relations in Star Trek is kissing. So scandalous. So scandalous. I'm going to go baseball because it just seems so stupid. Correct. Yeah. It is a form of baseball. He falls down, crushes some flowers, immediate death penalty. Yeah. Because flowers are sacred, probably. It's it's actually dumber than that. So do you want is the reason? The... Yeah. It's so great. So this planet has like zero crime because sections are sectioned out, essentially. And that square meterage is the only part that's policed. So if any law is broken from jaywalking to murder to theft within that specific 10 meter square area or mile range, death penalty, whatever it is. So he basically violates a do not walk on the grass sign while this area is in effect. (laughs) Why would people go to the sex planet knowing that that place exists? They didn't know. They were ignorant hold of on. the laws. Hold on. No, 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 no. Yeah, huh? oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, Terrible briefing. Why did they go to this planet if not for sex? Did you not? No, yeah, no, they did. Yeah, but that's not breaking any laws. Hold on, they hold went, on. No, no, yeah. no, 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 mm-hmm. no. Go with me here. So yeah. all they know is like the brochure that they picked up on the streets of like Vegas. Like there's a sex planet. We're going to go to it. They don't mm-hmm. know the mm-hmm. laws. They just go there. Yeah. They did not research this at all. How, it's the, yeah. How would the, how would the captain even let that happen agree zero defense 
No, no. I mean, this is pretty fundamental, isn't it? Like, you don't. This planet has zero crime for this reason. You don't do that. Yeah. You don't go don't. to a planet for sex not knowing the laws. Nah. Apparently you do. Again, so much prime directive being broken here. I don't know if I believe any of this is true. Hey, the alien god prevents the Enterprise from just beaming away unless Picard gives a speech on justice. The god that these aliens believe in. B, the Edo, which is the aliens, move to kill Wesley before they can escape, but they beam away at the last second. I kind of like how stripped down and simple this is because yeah, I like you put really layers. like add in the yeah. details. This I gives me so much, so much room this for just, just filling in yeah, my huh? own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of love it. So in bo- in this scenario, you've got the crew realizes they're in big trouble and they're either going mm-hmm. to run or they're going to face their actions and be chastised by chastised by a speech. Those are my two options. So for A, the alien's god prevents them from beaming Wesley away mm-hmm. until Picard gives a speech about justice. Yeah, like they're like you have to give a speech to prove that you know better now. And B, the Edo moves to kill Wesley, but Wesley just gets beamed away. B. It is not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is literally that an alien that is the Edo's <sighs> god intervenes and says, hey, you can't do this, but is swayed by a speech about justice given by Picard. <laughs> my gosh. I almost went with that one because from a from a show writing perspective, it puts more of a bow on it because we can say that a Picard addressed the issues with the crew. I love how simple it was. I love how simple it was. It was oh, kind man. of fun. I really enjoyed that. <gasps> I have yes. an idea for another yeah. season of Captain's Pod. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. We I'll s- add it to the requests. Okay, we start off with yeah. you saying, Danae, what are your predictions? Mm-hmm. I just go off of pure whatever's in my imagination. You don't even know the title. No title, no nothing. I just tell you what mm-hmm. I see in mm-hmm. my mind, okay? You find the associated episode with what I've seen and then oh, watch it. Oh, that's amazing. The, the, uh, so the, but we, uh, we, we couldn't yeah. appointment set with the audience unless no. we did this part live. Yeah, we would have to do that part ahead of time. Yeah, at the end of every oh, episode, we would of, set yes, up. Yes, mm-hmm. we do the next one. Yeah, I love that. Cameron will know this. Sorry, I've been watching a lot of like army, like military-ish movies. I had a bit of a binge this week. So we've got like Crimson Tide, um, Courage Under Fire um there was uh benghazi the 13 hours movie so so is this a uk and us thing and i think cameron might know the answer to this like the salute in like which one like there's the american salute which i think is like flat to the flat to the head and then i think there's like a there's a uk one and then i think the uk one is actually like straight down but the hand placement i know is really really important and I just think that Cameron will be able like, to answer. That's a lot to ask Cameron to do. Not only does Cameron need to know all this information, but then needs to succinctly type it in a yeah. small text box in such a fashion that when you read it, it we somehow understand. So uh-huh. palm, palm out, palm in, palm perpendicular. <laughs> palm perpendicular? Oh my gosh. <laughs> what is happening right now? I did see last week that so, so this is so funny. Somehow the um or one of the uh, captain's chairs from the next generation went on auction. And what's really funny is that it went on auction and people at CBS, Paramount, wh- whatever it is, were like, huh, that's been missing for a while. We wondered where that went. Um, and it's been taken down from auction and has either been purchased or has been sent return to, to yeah. return to Paramount. I'm sure they had to purchase it or something. But I think it's going to go into the archive and be on display somewhere. But I just love that. Like, that blows my mind that it just appears in an well, auction. And then it... Paramount are like, huh, that's where that went. But <laughs> How do you lose that? Oftentimes things are just thrown away and people will grab it out of the trash. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a, it's a fucking chair. It's the chair of the Enterprise. D- one of the biggest TV shows from the 90s. And the chair just like goes missing. And I'm like, oh. That's where that went. Could we have that back, please? Just, Man, what a I, I want to know the story. I want to know how it went from A to B to C to auction. So I want to know that too. Let's find out. So interesting. Maybe we will eventually find out. For almost three decades, one of the most famous pieces of furniture in Star Trek history was lost, according to gizmodo.com. 
the captain's chair of the USS Enterprise D introduced in the next generation second season and seen on screen all the way through the series conclusion in 94 by the time the Enterprise set was refreshed for Star Trek Generations Picard's perch had vanished until very very recently it was revealed for the first time in decades as part of a huge upcoming haul of Star Trek Star Wars and other film and TV props announced for auction by Prop Store last month and set to go up for bid this week the captain's chair which the memorabilia company went to great lengths to screen match and prove that it was indeed the long lost screen mm, used hero chair. Not just a replica. Was yeah. expected to auction for around, you want to guess? $10,000. $200,000. <laughs> is that so <laughs> ridiculous? <laughs> 50 to 100,000. But now Trek Corps reports that on the day of the auction's opening, Prop Store had agreed to return the chair to CBS 30 mm -hmm. years since it went missing. That's amazing. Quote, though a valued partnership between Prop Store Limited and CBS Studios Inc. and an amicable agreement among all parties involved has been reached to restore Captain Jean-Luc Picard's iconic Star Trek The Next Generation's Captain Chair to the Star Trek archive. Somebody from Prop Store said that. I don't know who. Oh, it was a, it was a statement on their website. Amazing. The chair will be preserved as a piece of science fiction history. Yeah, While the will. whereabouts of the chair had been unknown for three decades, the Star Trek archive is currently working on plans to showcase it for Star Trek fans to see firsthand in the upcoming year. That's now. So fun. So, so cool. I want to sit in that chair. Oh, look, ships and shit. So many ships, I'm going to die. <laughs> Calm oh, yourself. It's Akira. It's an Akira class. Look at the little shadow. The Akira. <sighs> That's a nebula. Nebula class. Oh, just class there's an enterprise d over there a galaxy class Whew, that was a lot ta, 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 ta.